it's been recorded. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I just, as you, we said, it it's to kind of introduce this this course that we're putting together. Um, and so I'm not going to go into sort of super details on 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 stuff. I'm going to show you the kind of things that we're going to cover um, uh, in the, in the course. Um, yeah. So just a little bit of my my background here. Um, and so. Yeah, you've kind of already been, been through that. Um, what's probably the most relevant thing is I've been doing teaching courses for what's was it 23 now. So this is uh, so eight years. So I've been doing mostly doing different courses. Um, um, and someone asked about software uh, and most of the software courses, uh, courses I've been doing, I've been using Petrel. Um, so um, we're gonna kind of, I'll, I'll show you some slides that, that show you some of the uh, features in Petrel. Um, uh, I'm not envisaging the course to be a sort of uh, click and click kind of course per se. It's, it's more to show you what you can do because um, uh, we've got a lot of topics that we want to try and maybe cover. Okay, so just so, just so you know about that. Um, but why seismic interpretations are important is, well, to try and avoid this situation. Um, and I know it's a kind of a little bit ridiculous, you know, we're not going to drill that many wells. Um, but, you know, um, what we're trying to do is is work out what's there to reduce the risk um because we don't want to spend a lot of money drilling wells that don't go anywhere um and and that's uh, you know and then also environmentally you know this is some environmental nightmare that you've got here with all these wells um i'm not sure exactly where it is i think it's uh california actually because there's palm trees um but you know can we can we be better at, at, at risking our um, our prospects uh, reducing the number of wells um, maybe not drilling wells if we don't think anything's there. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with, uh, with, with seismic interpretation. Um, so the idea at the moment is for, is for the course to be um, sort of three sessions, and that would be sort of four hours a session. Um, and the sessions would obviously be recorded, and then um, any material will be shared with the participants. Um, and things like software, we'd have to, we'd have to sort of work out what what people needed to do for, for software. And I won't say any more about that. That's not really my, my department, okay? If they wanted to kind of follow some of the things that were shown, uh, but that's something uh, a little bit extra. Um, but the idea would be to kind of go through um, a bunch of the sort of um, latest things or newest things in, in, in seismic interpretation um, to talk about. Um, so this is kind of an agenda. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not set in stone. Um, is exactly um, what we can what we're going to put in there, um, but these are kind of the things that, uh, as far as I see it at the moment. So we'd have kind of a, just a, a, a quick review to make sure that uh, you know that we're all talking about the same thing, um, and talk about things like true amplitude seismic uh, and what that means, um, and talk about depth data versus time data, which is becoming more and more relevant um, as we have more and more depth data. Okay, so what's the best way to deal with uh, with, with, uh, with that, do you, do you interpret in depth or do you interpret in time and, 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 and what's, the, what's the right answer? Uh, and, and it's not the same answer for every single case. Um, we'll talk about correlation um, between well and the seismic. So, you know, obviously the well logs, um, the tie, um, synthetics and things like that. Um, and then um, coming back to, you know, okay, I've got my depth data, but my depth data doesn't necessarily fit my log data. So what what do I do? How do I how do I fix that? Okay, um, and then as part of this, um, we're going to talk about some of the things we can do in, with with, with the, you know, going beyond interpretation, um, and, and that's things like inversion. And, and we want to get wavelets to do that, uh, and it's the well to seismic correlation that that is where we get those wavelets. Um, so what do we need to do to get a good wavelet um, that will give us a good uh, a good interpretation, oh, sorry, a good in inversion, which then will give us a, a good idea of what's going on. Um, so then the next thing would be to talk about um, interpretation. Um, you know, so maybe just review things like auto tracking and uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, talk about fault interpretation, things that we can do, use ghosts, um, and then maybe spend a little bit more time on 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 things like flattening uh, uh, flattening your surfaces. Okay, so to, so taking out geological time um, and, and flattening your 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 data um, and, and seeing what you can what you can get. Okay, 
um, and then you know converting that into in, into surfaces. So that would be sort of the the, the first day as, as as I see it at the moment. Um, then the second day we talk about uh, depth conversion. So you know, it's a big topic, but you know things that you want to to think about when you're doing depth conversion. Um, and then this comes back to our depth versus uh, time question. You know, so are we doing everything in depth or are we doing everything in time? And what's the what's the best way to do it? Um, then we'll talk about attributes. So um, you know what they are um, and, and how we can use them. Um, and you know this is uh, something that we that's becoming more and more useful because we if we come back here, we now have true amplitude seismic. Okay, so if we go back uh, not so long ago, um, if I made attributes from from seismic data, the, the seismic wasn't necessarily true amplitude. So my amplitudes, my so my amplitudes and my attributes weren't then correct, and that's okay for some of them. But what I was trying to do with the attributes was correlate them with with rock properties, and and that didn't work very well. Um, so um, you know now we've got true amplitude data in in almost all cases. So that then is going to work better, okay? Um, yeah. So um, yeah, and then we'll talk about combining attributes, um, and that's going to lead us into the sort of um, AI. So this is a big topic everyone's talking about. So um, doing classifications of, of of data, okay? So taking my attributes and, and and plugging them into into software, and I can do it by Myself with two attributes or three attributes. Um, when I start getting four and five and six, I probably need to use some kind of other. Um, you know, I can't just do a cross plot in in. in I, can't, well, I can't even imagine what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to use a neural nets or other um, other AI tools to to, to do that. Uh, and we'll talk about the the supervised classification and and artificial intelligence applications. So that's to take my, my seismic data. Um, and and basically split it up into different classes, um, and hopefully those classes mean something. Okay, um, and that's where the AI can't help you. Okay, because they because the AI can give you the classes, but you got to then decide what's what. Uh, I'm not sure that we are getting to the um, well. We ever get to the point where the AI can tell me tell you what's oil and what's not oil. Okay, luckily for us. Um, then we talk about fault interpretation, and again, this is somewhere where. Um, AI is coming in, so uh, uh, we'll talk about the attributes that work, help me to do fault interpretation, um, and then your know, automatic fault extraction, fracture identification, um, and again, there's a bunch of AI um, applications that are that are coming in, um, and some of these are, are are sort of standard. Some of them are well, not quite standard. They're, they're coming in as plugins to to, to software packages, um, and you know maybe. Talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's out there, um, and you know, in my opinion, the, the fault interpretation, um, you know, it, it's either a fault or not a fault, uh, and that's somewhere that maybe some of the artificial intelligence uh, software will work a little bit better. Um, you know, so you know, as I say, it's either a fault or not a fault, and so that's black and white, and that's you know what computers are good at. Um, trying to dif differentiate between different classifications is maybe not so easy. Okay. So that will be sort of uh, the second day. Um, and then the third day, we'll be looking at um, things like uh, um, you know, applying the classification, spectral decomposition, wedge modeling, uh, blending, um, things like that. Um, and then also you know, AVO inversion, um, lithology determination. So taking, um, so take, going beyond just sort of normal interpretation of you know, picking layers and, and, and uh, faults, and then Doing quantitative calculations, okay. So that's a kind of you know. So this is kind of where um, uh, uh, we're we are in the thinking right now for this course. Um, but you know, this is it's always up to, up for a little bit of uh, um, of, of tweaking around. Uh, so what we what we're trying to do when we do interpretation is um, you know is to kind of, kind of help not help the drillers. It's not maybe the wrong word to say, but you know we want to find where the where the hydrocarbon is. Um, and one of the big problems that we have, and you can kind of see this by by the agenda here, you know. Um, so, if we had a a course on seismic interpretation in 1990, um, we wouldn't have had any of these. Well, well, we've had some of the topics, but there would be very, very few of these topics would be relevant. Okay, 
because we wouldn't have really been able to do much in the way of calculating attributes. Um, we wouldn't be able to flatten horizons. We wouldn't be making surfaces. Um, we'd be doing our ties, um, but we wouldn't have true amplitude data. Um, and a lot of things have happened, okay? And we wouldn't have had any of this um, fascist analysis. Well, we could do it by hand, but we wouldn't have something that the software is producing and we wouldn't have quantitative interpretation, okay? So this is kind of a good thing and a bad thing because the seismic interpreter um, is being asked to do a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff than they were used to, used to be asked to do, okay? Um, and I think part of that is reflected in the, in the balance between uh, you know, the number of geologists versus number of geophysicists in a, or interpreters in a, in a group has kind of changed from you know, 20, 30 years ago. Okay, you maybe have a little bit more, you have more geophysicists now because there's more work to do, okay? Um, so we have a lot of data. Um, uh, and the other thing that is that our elephants have gone away, okay? So we don't have these big, um, easy fields to find anymore. Um, so we're, we're, we're needing, we have to use things like uh, thickness calculations or, or tuning um, to try and find the, the, the reservoirs because they're thinner than they were. Okay, so they're all tuning. Or the one, you know, the, the nice big reservoir that doesn't tune is, has been drilled many years ago. We're looking at the smaller, smaller features. Okay, so we got more data than we had, uh, and what we're looking for is smaller. Okay, um, we have better data, so that's a good thing. But do we have the time to to, to looking at it, look for it? Um, and then also, you know, you need to think about what you want to do. Okay, so um, what's the what's the plan? You know, what, what, what are you trying to, to, to get out of it, okay? So if you just want to, to map the surfaces, that's a different project than if you want to try and produce a porosity map to then look for sweet spots in the, in, in the reservoir. Okay, so that makes a, so there's a, a sort of, uh, you know, a lot of things you can do, um, and we very rarely ever have enough uh, time, okay? Um, you know, so it, it's, always a, it's always a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, I seem to, I think I rem remember back in the uh, 2008 when there was that sort of down downturn, um, a, a whole bunch of questions appeared from, from, uh, from clients uh, along the lines of, oh, you remember that uh, work you did for us six months ago or a year ago? Uh, what about it? Um, can, you know, well, what, can you explain what you've done? Um, and that was basically because they hadn't had time to look at it. Um, and in 2008, a lot of the drilling stopped and then, then they had time, okay? So um, you've got more data than you probably need or, or want. Um, it, it was a lot easier when you had six 2D lines um, and some colored pencils. Uh, <laughs> but then um, there were a lot of dry holes drilled. Uh, you know, so, so yeah, I think, I think this is better. It's easier now in, in, in many ways, okay? Um, yeah, and then one thing that's important is, is understanding the limitations of the data. Okay, um, you know, so I'm not going to be able to see a meter, a meter sand <laughs> um, at two kilometers. It's not going to happen. Okay, so um, just just be aware of that. Uh, you know, the, I can run a lot of these processes and get some answers. Um, so I can always do some of these calculations, but do they mean anything? You know, I can always run inversion and I can always get a, an, an acoustic impedance uh, cube, but does it really mean anything? Okay. So is my is my target going to be be visible? Um, and so 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 don't try and chase things that you that you you know you won't be able to see, or or if you can't see, you need to get better seismic. Okay. Um, so a big part of the um, sort of exercise now for for a lot of interpretation is is relating back to rock physics, um, and you know this is uh, sometimes something that the geophysicists interpreters involved with, sometimes it's not, depends a little bit on the company. Um, so some of the bigger companies, you have a whole rock physics group. Um, some of the smaller companies, you, you, you know, you're the rock physics group yourself. Um, you know, and what we're, we're interested in is things, you know, here's the p-velocity versus porosity, okay? So this is something I can use. So if I can get an attribute that, that, that's related to, to, to the p-velocity or the acoustic impedance, um, then maybe there's a relationship with the porosity, okay? So then, so instead of having a, you know, a map of the top and the bottom of my reservoir, I can come up with a, a map of the porosity in my reservoir. And it's gonna have a little bit of uncertainty in it, but that's gonna maybe help me reduce the risk on that prospect compared to the next prospect 
where I just where I don't have this. Okay, um, and we're very dependent on the quality of the of the reservoir uh, model. So we have to have some wells. So if you're working somewhere where you don't have any wells or the wells are really old, um, you know you you can't make this nice plot with all kinds of different lithologies here and and you know and the and you can see this the soft suspended rocks here and, and a whole bunch of things. Um, you know, you you may not have this, so then, well, then you can't do this. So that's that's okay. So that's one thing off your off your list. But if you do have this, um, you know, is it going to be feasible? Do I have a relationship between porosity and and something that the seismic will measure? Okay. Um, and um, you know, here's some some old two D data. Um, so the seismic data, we're going to relate that potentially to the to the to the well data. Um, so if you don't have any well data. We, we don't have, it's not going to be possible to do that. And we don't have any check shots. It's not going to be possible to calibrate our seismic. Okay. Um, you know, hopefully you're somewhere where you, where you have that. Um, we may be working with 2D data. I, I know about tw um, 15 years ago, there was a d debate that went on um, about removing the 2D capability from some of the software. Um, I think it was a slightly silly debate. Um, um, and you know, people said, look, well, there's still a lot of 2D data required. And they're like, really? Uh, not where we work. Yeah, well, but that's, you know, there's a, there's a big world, okay? So we still have 2D data, um, 3D, and, and increasingly we've got, we've got time-lapse 4D data, okay? So um, what, can we, what can we do with that? And, and if you're working in Norway, you'll have, you know, yeah, I think 15, 10, 50, or over at least more than 10, at least in some like locations, repeat seismics. Um, and then some of the seismic, or most of the seismic we work with is P waves, but we have some S waves as well. Okay, so 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 that's just something else we'll maybe uh, mention in the course. Um, so our seismic is going to give us our, um, you know, our structural and stratigraphic information, um, at, at least hopefully. Um, and then on top of that, we might be able to get quantitative um, information from that. Relating back to, to our rock physics. Um, this is some 2D data. So one of the big issues with 2D data is that it's not, um, well, very unlikely to be the correct amplitudes because we're not collecting all the energy that's, that's coming back from the, from the reflectors. So that's not something that we can necessarily do, uh, do, to, do, do 2D, oh, sorry, do um, quantitative work with. It's gonna have a big question mark. Um, and then we probably don't have the well control. Okay, so we're mostly going to do quantitative work with with, with 3D seismic. Um, yeah, so we're looking for features of interest, um, things like channels, um, and what we're going to try and do with the seismic is basically give us you know input to our to our geological model. You know, um, so I think this is kind of the sort of standard uh, seismic interpretation. Um, maybe won't spend so much time talking about about that um, and try and maybe talk a little bit more about um, you know things like attributes and quantitative interpretation. Um, so you know that, that's a little bit you know sort of beyond not beyond but sort of um, not just the interpreter. You know where's my where's my top of my uh, um, Cretaceous? Where's the top of the Jurassic? Um, so we might have information related to thickness of beds. We might have information related to fluids, we might have relation, information related to porosity, okay? Um, if we're lucky, okay? So I've got seismic attributes. Um, and one of the issues with, with a lot of the attributes is that they are um, relative properties, okay? Um, and a lot of times um, we don't have a good correlation. So if I go back to my rock physics here, I don't get a good correlation between relative properties and my, my rock physics. Sometimes it works. Okay, so sometimes um, you know my seismic reflection is a change in acoustic impedance, uh, basically, um, and the change in acoustic impedance will, will maybe um, correlate with the porosity. Um, basically, what that means is that the layer above my my zone of interest doesn't change. Okay, and so I can get a correlation between um, relative properties and the rock physics. A lot of times we don't because the, the air, the overburden's changing. It's not the same everywhere. So we got the reservoir changing and the overburden changing and, and we don't know what's going on. 
Um, so then we have to go in, and look at things uh, that are absolute values, and this is where we get the conversion. Okay, so we're going to convert our um, our uh, seismic uh, um, basically angle stacks, so angle information, and we're going to convert that to, to rock properties, um, and then use them to to correlate with uh, with uh, um, the rock physics. Okay, so sometimes I can just use the acoustic impedance, so I can do it from full stack data. Um, depending on the rock physics, I may need to have um, information about the VPVS and density, um, uh, you know, other properties to be able to, to tick out things like fluid effects. So um, what I need to do is then have AVO inversion, okay? But what we're trying to get out of it, and this is kind of a, you know, an old slide, um, is to get a, a reservoir model, okay, a geological model. And we're gonna use that to, um, to uh, um, uh, uh, we're going to use that to um, uh, basically be our, 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 our input into the uh, reservoir modeling, um, into calculating the, the, the economics and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so we can give the geologists, um, you know, the tops and the time, you know, where the reservoir stops and starts, that's easy enough. Um, but if you can give them things like you know, okay, that's sand, that's that's not sand. Um, if we can give them porosity, if we can give them ideas, you know, do these classifications and they turn out to be related to uh, to, to lithologies, that's a big help for them, okay? Um, they don't have to do this uh, kind of uh, uh, statistical modeling to produce their, their properties. If, if we can say, look, well, you know, there's a reasonably good chance that's a high porosity layer and it's sand. Oh, okay, great, help, that's a big help because then I can, um, tune my modeling to, to fit that um, rather than having some kind of net to gross that, 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 that is, is, is very, very uh, average. Okay, so that, that's, all, that's where we're kind of trying to go with all of the sort of seismic interpretation. Okay. Um, and I mentioned this already that, you know, that if I went back to, well, maybe, I've, yeah, maybe, maybe not 1990, but certainly mid, mid, 80, mid 80s, it was a lot easier being a seismic interpreter, um, you know, no, that's that's even before my time, um, because well, not easier in some ways. You you had a lot fewer things you needed to worry about. Um, um, what was hard is you only had a few lines, so you had to try and work out what was going on between a few lines. Um, uh, you know, but what's happened in in you know the last 20, 30 years is we've had you know an explosion in the amount of of, of data sets we can create. Okay, um, I don't know how many. Um, attributes there are in Petrel, but I think you know you could easily make a hundred cubes um, that you then would need to have a look at, maybe. Um, and so you you know, trying to work out which cubes work where is is, is something that's quite quite important. Okay. Um, and one of the things that's sort of a little bit debatable, or you know, some people will say it's 2010. Um, some people will say it's it's less. It's 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 actually you know after that. Um, there is a point where our processing understanding of uh, uh, getting true amplitude data kind of is a standard thing, okay? Uh, as I say, some people say, well, we'll say around about 2010. Some people are, are say, well, a little bit before that. Some people are a little bit more pessimistic about it. Um, but a lot of the work that was done on attributes back in here kind of went a little bit wrong. Um, and, and the reason for that was because basically we're, we were not using true amplitude data, okay? Um, and so what we want to try and um, you know, make sure in, at the start of any project is that the, that the data we've got is, is true amplitude or amplitude preserved, however you want to describe it. Um, if it's not, then that kind of limits the things I can do. So I can still interpret the data. Um, so T, 2D data is probably unlikely to be True amplitude, however they processed it, because a lot of the data, a lot of the energy disappears off into away from the from the sources and the, from the receivers. Okay, um, so doing anything quantitative on that is going to be um, you know, it's going to be difficult. Okay, so you have legacy data that hasn't been reprocessed from two thousand. It's probably not going to be true amplitude data. So then be careful about trying to to calculate again porosity or anything quantitative from it. Okay. Um, yeah, and so what I'm going to try and do is show you examples of, of the things we talk about in Petrel. Um, there are some things that are not in Petrel, 
um, you know, there's a lot of other um, companies out there. So some of the newest things are not have not been implemented. Um, in, in you know, the trials are a package that covers a lot of stuff, um, and so things that are really cutting edge don't necessarily get there until you know um, someone has to, to code it up and someone has to have the rights for the software. Um, so some of the things that we talk about won't be um, won't be in Petrel, but some of the things will be. Um, so I'll, I'll try and, sh and show Petrel examples. Um, I mentioned the trample shoot. Um, here's just an example of a, of a of a workflow. I won't go through the details. Um, um, what I will just say is, look, you know, here's 2011. Um, the important part of this, or the important thing, is the QC. Um, so here's their their well logs um, and Here's their synthetic, and their seismic looks pretty good. Okay, so they've checked to see that their seismic is is reflecting the uh, the synthetic. Um, this can be a little bit trickier than you than you imagine uh, sometimes because uh, um, if we do uh, seismic well ties, um, what you find a lot of times is you get um, a poor match. Um, and that's because there's lots of things like multiples and stuff like that. Um, I think they picked an example that uh, where there weren't a lot of multiples. So my synthetic has, um, you know, pretty similar reflections. But it's in here. You know, you can see that um, here's my offset here, um, and the synthetic is predicting that it's there's not much variation. Um, and here's their real data, and they've uh, they're in their processing workflow, except for the very very far offsets here. I think they've done a pretty good job. Okay, so this data is probably going to be something I can rely on to do quantitative work on, because I think they've, you know, I, 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 with, the, with the exception of not taking the very far offset traces here, which look like they won't be. So what I'm going to do is cut, up, cut it off at the point where I think the, the true amplitude is not working anymore, or try and fix it. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, um, a lot of the data we're getting now is um, pre-PSDM depth. Um, so what's the correct, um, thing to do? Um, and I think it's tempting for the geologists to look at the depth data and interpret the depth data, um, for a geophysicist, if I wanted to do inversion, for example, um, I'm kind of forced to, 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 to take the time data. Okay. Um, and what this is the same, it's the same processing. And basically what they've done is they converted the depth data back to time. Um, and I think you can kind of see that the time data, or sorry, the depth data stretched. So that means that my wavelets has, has changed. So a lot of the things we do with things like inversion uh, and a lot of our attributes don't work in, um, in, in depth data. Um, the other thing is that when they've done the depth imaging, they've generally have started from a, a, a collection of wells, okay? But in the processing, there's a time difference, or sorry, a, a depth difference. So the processing has kind of um, improved the image and kind of moved things later, uh, laterally. Um, and we don't necessarily get a, get a perfect tie anymore to the wells, okay? So um, one thing we could do is just do everything in depth and then um, correct it um, so that the wells tie. Um, what might be better um, is to work on the time data and then do the sort of uh, standard depth conversion process that you do for um, P pre-stack time data, okay? Uh, basically because the PSDM has fixed the lateral variations, but it hasn't necessarily fixed the, or, or there, there are vertical variations that are left in there that we can try and, 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 and fix, okay? Um, but Talking to people around the, the industry, um, there seems to be, um, there are people that are just interpreting the depth data and correcting it. Um, but there are also people doing it, what I would call it more the correct way. Um, but the correct way takes takes more time. And I think that's the reason why some people are, are well, taking the, it's not a shortcut, but they're, they're, they're taking a slightly different approach. Okay. Um, I mentioned well ties. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that um, because I need to get a wavelet for my inversion. Okay, so um, if I want to just work out what horizons what, that's pretty okay. It's not not that you know 
I think, uh, you know, it's a fairly simple standard uh, process. I stick a stick in a Ricker wavelet, the right frequency, and then I try and, and see if I, you know, okay, there's the, there's the upper Cretaceous, there's the lower Cretaceous. Okay, yeah, everything, that makes sense. Um, but there's also, I'm using um, uh, extracting wavelets for inversion and for some other, you know, there's some other places we could use them for modeling. Um, we'll, we'll get a nicer looking uh, synthetic if we if we extract a wavelet than if we, uh, sorry, we'll have something that looks more like the seismic if we extract a wavelet. Um, so um, this is just an example of the uh, uh, seismic well tie in Petrel um, and my extracted wavelet in, the, in here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Um, and you can see it's a, it looks okay. Um, and this is gonna be some in, an input into, into things like inversion. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the course, definitely. Um, I mentioned um, flattening. Um, this is kind of a useful thing to do. Um, and you know, when we got 3D data in the 90s, it was great because you could see channels. Okay, you had the time slice and you could see channels because before it was a little bit of an, a, a mess. You had 2D lines you used to try and guess where the channel went. Um, if you could even identify the channel on the, on the 2D line. So I got a time slice and it's much, much easier. I think the next slide shows you that, yeah. So here's my 2D line or my, you know, my, my line here and here's my, um, my channels, okay? But you can see they're kind of a little bit messed up in that I got crossing channels. Um, and I don't have to be like a, the world's best geologist to know that, that, you know, you don't see many rivers where you have channels that cross you know, that's not, they're not like roads where you have a nice, you know, traffic lights and the water stops. Um, so there's something maybe not quite what we want going on here. Um, and the reason for this could be, is this, is this. Um, so my time slice is time, right? And it's time now. So, so relative to the surface, but my um, channels were deposited in geological time. So there's a different, so, um, what I need to do is go up and down on my time slice to find my channels, okay? And there's different ways of doing it. I can do a, a horizon slice, so it's following the top surface. I could follow the bottom surface if I wanted to, depending, you know, is it um, how the relationship is. To, so horizon slice would be kind of on lap. Um, I can do proportional slices if I think this time and this time. Um, I could, you know, um, also just flatten the horizon um, rather than doing a slice. So, so this slightly different ways of doing the same thing. But the idea is to get things back to geological time. Um, yeah, here's an example here. Um, so yeah, this has been taken out of Petrel. So what we've done is we flattened our, uh, we've picked a horizon and we flattened it, okay? So hopefully if I, once I've done that, yeah, and here's an example of that. Once I've done that, um, you know, you can see there's a channel here. It's a little bit messy, but there's a channel here that goes from being red to blue and then it kind of does something funny there. And then I'm not quite sure where it goes. Um, and this is the original time slice. If I now flatten my cube on a horizon and then now look for the channel, you can see that it's a little bit clearer. So you can see it's red here and red all the way through here. And then it goes, and then I'm not quite sure, but it might go around the corner here and then over here, okay? Um, so I can kind of, I can kind of see it on the time slice on the flattened slice, it's a lot clearer um, what's going on. And I also get rid of this kind of one half being blue, one half being red, okay? So basically there's been some distortion from tectonics or, or uh, from compaction. That's, that's basically meant that my uh, time slice is not, is not geological time. So we'll look at that and uh, it's one of the things we'll talk about in the course. Um, mentioned attributes quite a lot already. Um, this is the old famous slide from Tanner. I forgot to take, I, sorry, lost, dropped the reference. Um, this is the sort of um, where you get um, the uh, amplitude and the quadrature and uh, the reflection strength out of, um, you know, I think uh, it's almost a, almost compulsory to have this slide anytime you talk about uh, seismic attributes or a variation of it. Um, yeah, so we can calculate the attributes in, in, in the software. Um, you know, so here's one of them. This is the reflection strength, which is basically the length of this vector here. Um, and hopefully I can see different features in my, in my uh, seismic. So that would be an A to interpretation. Um, and then also I can plug this into um, the, the neural nets um, and get some, some uh, try and use this to, as a sort of input to my classification. 
Um, yeah, so this is just showing you um, some attributes and then flattening combined. Um, and I think this is supposed to be an atoll. Um, and there's some, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, and this is the curvature. So where we've got a kind of an, an edge, we're getting a, 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 a signal from the, from the, from this, the seismic, okay? So I could go in and look at the amplitude data and, and find these things, but you know, maybe I can calculate something like curvature. And so I'll get a curvature where I get a, a bend. Um, and this might be also happen when I have fractures, okay? So, um, you know, can I use attributes to, to make my interpretation a little bit better or, or easier? Um, and one thing that we have to worry about, um, you know, if I look at the amplitudes here, Okay, so this is my reflection strength. So this is going to be, you know, if I got a big contrast, um, I'm going to get a high uh, reflection strength. So I've got um, a fluid change or a porosity change. Um, the thing I also have to worry about is that um, as my thickness of my layers change, um, I get amplitude changes that are, that are related to the to the to the layer thickness. Okay, so this is tuning, um, and so this is um, you know something that's quite uh, quite important. Um, you know. The way the world's been put together, unfortunately, uh, you know, your your oil field's not out here; it's always in there. So the sand you're all, you're looking for is always, wow, well, yeah. I'm being a bit pessimistic, but very often it seems to be that the the the, the, the things you're interested in are right in the tuning thickness, um, and it's going to vary for different frequencies, and we can use that. Okay, so what I can do is calculate attributes. All right, so if I've got um, you know, a, a sort of system here with, with channels and various features that have different thicknesses, they'll tune at different thicknesses. So basically this, this wedge model here will, um, you know, the high amplitudes will be at different, uh, um, different wavelengths basically. And different, so that means then different frequencies, if I know the velocities. And so what I can try and do is get an attribute that shows those variations, okay? So if I've got, um, so in this case, um, this is a map view now, so my, you know, I've, I'm going to show my 30 hertz in, in yellow, the 20 hertz in red, and the and the uh, 10 hertz in blue. Okay, um, and what I can do is um, combine these and, and and do blending, and we'll we'll talk about that. So you've probably seen, if you haven't done it, you've probably seen these pictures in the in first break and places like that. Okay, so we're at, so basically the colors. So what I'm doing is essentially taking three different cubes. And then coloring, giving one, making red, making the other one green, and then the other one blue, and the combination. So if they're the same, they, they come out as kind of white. Um, and if they're different, they come out as a color. Okay. So this is a way of comparing, of kind of combining these uh, spectral uh, um, decomposition uh, uh, cubes. Um, I can also use blending for, for other inputs. Um, you know, so it's very common to see uh, frequencies. You know, here's another one with. Uh, from, and it's been taken for first break. Uh, so here's 20 hertz, 34 hertz, 48 hertz. Okay, uh, uh, what did I do here? I did 25, 35, 45. Okay, so you go in and try and find the frequencies that will find the features that you're interested in, uh, and then you can compare them. Okay, uh, but I can do this with any kind of data. Um, but just very often you see it with, uh, with frequency data. Um, so yeah, so I've got attributes that help me with interpretation. Um, and then we've got the, the calculations that we can do, um, so the quantitative interpretation. Um, and so um, here's an example of basically um, looking to see which attribute correlated best with my um, porosity in my well logs. Okay, so I basically had a lot of wells here. I could plot up um, porosity and then the reflection strength at the well location from my seismic cube. Um, and I could I find there was a pretty good correlation. So I'm just gonna do a regression. So I'm going to take my reflection strength cube uh, and convert it to porosity. And this works sometimes, doesn't always work. Okay. Um, a lot of times what I end up having to do is use multiple attributes and, and, we'll, and we'll talk about that. Um, the other thing I can do with attributes is go in and look for different lithologies. Okay. So um, what I can do is plug in a whole bunch of different uh, cubes. Um, and this is something that's been pulled from, from uh, uh, again, for first break, and this is Rocky Road and, uh, and the name that you, you, you can't avoid if you're looking at, if you're interested in machine learning and, and classification. Um, it's the Paradise Geophysics, isn't Paradise Geophysics? So Paradise Insights, I think we call that, is, is the name of the company. Um, and so what they, 
do is basically plug in a whole bunch of attributes, okay? Um, and then um, sort of plot them, plot them up in 26 uh, parameter space, which uh, you can't imagine. Um, and then they project it onto, onto a 2D space. Um, but basically what it does is it finds clusters in the data. Okay, so the different colors in these plots are gonna be um, different features. Um, and they've identified you know, these three uh, classes here. It's a little bit hard to see on this slide, but they find these, these three classes here are related to contacts uh, and hydrocarbons in this case. Um, but it could be sand versus shale. It could be carbonate versus whatever. Um, you know, uh, it's not necessarily going to work. You know, it's not necessarily going to be, uh, uh, in this case, DHIs, but it could be. Okay, so they're using the machine learning uh, because I can't do 26 dimensional space, um, and I'm pretty sure you can. Um, so we have attributes that we can calculate from the seismic cubes, just the, from the sort of standard cube. We can also look at AVO. Um, and I do know there's a fourth class before anyone com uh, does complaints. Uh, yeah, so there's a there's a fourth AVO class which goes basically like this. So it's essentially the third class, third AVO AVO three class class three, um, with a different overburden. But this is just showing you, you know, here's my different AVO classes, and then these are synthetics. Okay, so um, on full stack data, um, my class three gives me bright spots. Uh, class two gives me dim spots as does my class one. Um, but if I have gathers, they're gonna show up as different, different things, okay? So we'll talk about, um, uh, talk a little bit about AVO attributes. And um, here's just an example um, of something called fluid strength. Uh, so basically this is showing me where the, uh, where the, um, there's a variation away from the background trend essentially. So I've got a background trend that's water filled um, where I get some signal on this on this attribute, it, it's deviating from that background trend. Um, and in this case, it's probably related to gas. Okay. It might be something else, but uh, but if you uh, it, it, could, it could be uh, lithology, but in this case, it's it, it's fluid content. So we'll talk a little bit about those in the course. Um, one thing that we've got a problem with um, is that our seismic has a bandwidth, um, and so um, we're missing a bunch of information. Um, from the from the low frequencies and also high frequencies, okay. Um, so when we do things like inversion, so this is just showing you the inputs into into inversion. So we're going to basically stack our data up, um, and, I, and we could do gathers. Um, a lot of times, what we actually do is called is angle stacks. We take um, all the data with a similar incidence angle and stack it up. Um, and basically, what I'm going to do is is essentially do forward modeling. Um, repeatedly and match my input to my um, to my seismic data. Um, and there's different ways I can do this. Um, I can do uh, um, model-based inversion. I can do sparse spike. Um, uh, and there are a bunch of Bayesian inversions as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about inversions. Um, and one of the problems that we have with inversion is that the seismic's in here. So we get a product out. We get some values out that are um, relative values. Um, to be able to correlate with our well logs, which we're trying to do in this figure here, we need to add in this um, low frequency part, okay? Um, and right now, there's some information from the seismic velocities down here. Um, right now, we're doing that with a geological model, okay? Um, but there is some work being done to try and fill this in with, uh, with high frequency uh, FWI. Uh, I think I got a slide a little bit, you know, at the end of the, of the, of the uh, presentation here. Um, so this, this is a limitation that we have in our, in our inversion, okay? So this is, so what we're gonna do is correlate with our, with our properties. Um, and then we can try and interpret what we've got here. Um, and there's some attributes that have been calculated, uh, just some examples here. Um, so this is basically looking at um, PPVS and, and, and um, uh, AI here. Um, and what this is trying to do is to find the anomalous values. Okay, so basically this is the background trend in our data. And so the colors tell me if I'm above or below my anomalous, my, my background trend basically, my, my compaction trend. Um, and from our rock physics, we know that anything that's kind of in this corner from VPVS is, a hydrocar is probably hydrocarbon, okay? So what I can do is try and use this to, 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 to sort of, um, 
make sense of my inversion results. Okay, so here's my, um, you know, here's my VPVS here, and and low VPVS might mean hydrocarbon. Okay, so I got a whole bunch of stuff down here that might be interesting. If I take out the compaction trend, what I'm left with is something that looks a, lo a little bit more, a much more modest. Okay, so this is all um, compaction related VPVS rather than um, hydrocarbon uh, or, or fluid related VPVS. Okay, that's the kind of things that we can try and do with our inversion results. Um, yeah, I mentioned this with the with the uh, um, LFM. Um, this is some data from the Baron C. Um, and what they've done is they've done full waveform inversion for the velocities. And you see they've built a 14 hertz model. So that get, would actually get me up to the bottom of my seismic data. Um, the, the, the problem is that um, it's a little hard to see the scale, but it's very shallow. Okay, I think it's 500 milliseconds or 600 milliseconds. Uh, and the reason why it's only being done on this very uh, uh, limited uh, depth range is it's very, very computer intensive. Okay, so it takes a lot of computing power to get up to 14 Hertz. Um, so if I wanted to do four or five seconds, that's gonna take me an awful long time. Okay, um, and a lot of computing power. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're not really there that, no, not really there yet, we're getting there. Um, talk a little bit about time lapse. This is just showing you a, a 4D um, time lapse. So um, basically an inversion on, on the 4D data. Um, yeah, and then what this um, result showed was that, the, that there was an issue with the, the uh, um, injection and, and uh, sweeping, of, you know, the reservoir wasn't being swept properly. Um, so they uh, changed the way that the field was drilled. So this is using inversion and 4D to, 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 to uh, improve the, uh, the, 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 the well planning. Um, something else we can do with the uh, with, uh, um, inversion outputs or, you know, um, attributes maybe, but, but definitely about inversion outputs is to look for lithologies, okay? And, and what we're doing here is doing some Bayesian inversion. Um, so basically working out what the probabilities are for different lithologies. Um, and I won't, you know, spend too much time on getting towards, towards the end here. I don't want to keep you too long on a Saturday evening. Um, so basically what I can do is, is take my inversion uh, inputs so I've got uh, impedance uh, and other inversion outputs um, and use them to convert my um, cube into lithologies. So I think this is some data from, from Egypt. Um, and yeah, so what we're getting at is, is the probabilities of the different lithologies um, and the different lithologies, okay? And this is something that is, could be very useful for, the, uh, for building the uh, geological models. Because, then, because the moment I know it's sand, then I've got a different range of possible porosities than if it's some other lithology. You know, if I've got uh, um, shaley sand, I've got different lithologies and, and different geological properties. If I, can, if I can kind of narrow down which one it is, then that might be, might be very useful, okay? Um, and then where this is kind of going, uh, and this is stuff that's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, I mentioned that some things aren't in, in the sort of all the, the interpretation packages yet. This is something that's kind of, yeah, is it in, the, is it in Rock Doc? I can't remember if it is. Um, but what we're doing here is they're doing a joint inversion. So, um, so instead of doing inversion and then estimating the lithologies, what they're doing here is they're plugging the lithologies in at the starting point, right? So basically, because that's then gonna change the properties. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to invert for um, the elastic properties and the lithology at the same time. And that should give a better answer than just inverting for um, elastic properties and then converting them to, to, to lithologies. That's the kind of idea. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and this is just the different uh, uh, fascies here. Um, and then this is just showing you that they get a better answer. Okay, so. Um, Basically, um, if they did it this way, they got results that were clustered here and they didn't really fit in full on the line of the, um, what they expected to see. Um, if they do it the, uh, the way, including the inversion, uh, sorry, including the, the lithologies, they get a better fit. Basically, um, this, is, this is if they match this line here. And you can see they kind of match better on this one. 
there's a there's a bias in here. Okay. Um, and then in theory, also your inversion might run a little bit more quickly if you because you've eliminated a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities by saying, look, well, there's only this has got to be this uh, this uh, um, this uh, lithology. So then that limits the, the range of, of, of properties. Um, and then where they're going at the end of all of this, um, and again, this is something that's kind of popping up in some of the software packages, is instead of inverting for um, for lithology, let's just go back and start at the rock physics, right? So let's just invert for BPVS and density and, uh, no, sorry, for porosity, B clay and, and saturation and use, our, use that to calculate moduli and go back all the way to the rock physics, right? So then, uh, so then my elastic properties are a byproduct of that uh, and my lithologies aren't, but my elastic properties are. So then everything is nicely sort of uh, enclosed, okay? So I'm not inverting for elastic properties and then trying, them, trying to use them to calculate things like porosity. I'm inverting for porosity and then checking that the um, elastic properties fit, okay? Um, and uh, I know there's a plugin for Petrel that I don't think it's uh, available for everyone. I think it's uh, still in, in, uh, in, in development. Um, and I know there's other software that, 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 that will do it. Um, and then last topic, uh, just to mention stochastic inversion. Um, and so basically this is to allow us to look at um, a, a bunch of features, um, the high frequency features in our reservoir. And the big danger with the stochastic inversion is, is believing it um, is true. So it's a little bit like a Schrodinger's cat, you know, until you open the box, you don't know if the cat's alive or dead. Um, and I think you need to kind of treat stochastic inversion similar way. So what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to add a whole bunch of high frequency variations to my deterministic inversion. So if I do an inversion, um, sort of standard inversion of, of a sparse spike inversion, it's basically deterministic. I get the same answer every time, right? And it's an average property. Um, and the problem I have is if I try and use average properties to, for example, delineate um, lithologies, I get the wrong answer. Okay, so this is an example of, of, of doing that. Okay, so what they've done here is they've uh, basically said, look, everything below here is, is uh, shale, everything above here is sand. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, if I use that number on the deterministic inversion, I get eight and a half percent. If I calculate a whole bunch of these high frequency variations and they all fit the, the seismic, they all fit the, the well logs, but I don't know that they're there because I can't, I don't actually have any information from the seismic. Okay, so they all give me exactly the same synthetics, right? So I don't know which of them is correct. But what I can do is use them to get a better estimate of the sand, okay? So if I do that, I get, in this case, 13.2% is the most likely sand, not eight and a half percent. So if I, so basically my determinist conversion was, was averaging things out um, too much. So I was getting the, getting the wrong answer. Okay, but I've kind of got to, it's getting towards the end of the hour and I don't want to spend too much time. So just to say that um, we're going to cover these topics um, in, in our course, in this course. So it will be three times four hours. Um, and yeah, we'll record the sessions and, and, and share the material. So thank you for listening. And if anyone has any questions, um, 